all right guys so this is now in your in your notes this uh, spreadsheet is now in your notes so you have access to this you don't need to take notes of this okay this is in your lecture notes folder so we had already covered depository financial intermediaries yesterday yeah in the exit price with property and loss in both cases one is for hedging and one we have not hedged in the both cases we have taken 100% hedging there is no proposal hedging we have been 25 to 25% hedging then how will calculate the loss in that no, no, I didn't. I didn't understand your question. I said the exit price of property loss said that we have the hence the position. Yeah. So there, I had put a constraint. You're talking about the discussion of that question, yes, right? Sir. That what to do in those, how to solve those restriction problems, whether they need to be actively solved or whether you have to, yeah. So when we came to, so let's go back to that question briefly, and so that we know what we are discussing. If we have this case and. Uh, um, we had discussed it in the here itself, right? And actually, we should look at the. Um, the this is, we should actually look at this note, okay? So you're talking about question number three, right? Sir, no, yes. You're talking about question number three. So Rahul has already been marked absent. I hope. Yes, sir. He has been marked absent. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, your question is for question number three, yes, okay, and how we solve question number three. Only last one, exit price. Yeah, the last two parts, okay, let me clarify that, good that you asked a question there. So, let's clarify that once again, so that you understand uh, how we are doing that. Just to simplify matters, I've made that exam, uh, this is the one that we're talking about, right. To simplify matters, I had made that assumption while discussing that question. I had made the simplifying assumption because otherwise then you have too many combinations to deal with, okay? Because you can hedge 10%, you can hedge 15%, 25%, all that. So when you get into that, then, then there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, there are many more uh, types of answers. But to simplify matters, I had assumed here, let's go back to that part. Okay. Okay, so who's today's good gatekeeper? Today you are the scorekeeper. Who is going out? One person is going out. Just make sure that no other person goes out before they come in. All right. So your question is with respect to uh, seven point one and seven point two. Yes. Right. So seven point. <coughs> so your question. So here, what we are saying is, the answers we came up with. Okay, is that the answers are that in the case when you when you're running an active uh, hedging program, then uh, both of these seven point one and seven point two have to be actively solved in that the decisions are not the decision problems are not automatically solved okay that the circumstances do not give you an automatic solution you have to actively solve them okay at what price to exit whether with a loss or profit when you're running an, and then the other answer we came up with is that if you're running a passive hedging program okay are you guys all following so when somebody asks a question uh, questions are all quite relevant so uh, when you're running a passive hedging program then both of these questions are uh, decision problems are automatically solved. This is clear. Okay, now why did we come up with that? We did put an additional constraint. Okay, because even in a passive hedging program, you do have a choice. Okay, you can, if you feel that if your underlying position is long, let's say in oil, your underlying position is long, and you have a bearish view on the market, on the oil market, so you would want to hedge. But even in a passive hedging program, you do have some flexibility. You are not obligated to hedge 100% uh, you know at the, uh, the uh, when you hedge so you could hedge 25% or you could hedge 40% whatever okay so it, uh, unless you formulate the policy it depends on how the organization has formulated the policy but even in a normal hedging program there is no need to uh, put this additional constraint that you have to hedge 100% at, uh, at once okay so you can give them that much flexibility even in a passive hedging program as long as once you hedge 25% initially you can never lift that hedge okay and all you can do is increase the hedge okay you can never hedge and unhedge so uh, yes we did put that additional constraint in order to arrive at these two answers to highlight the differences between the the reason i did that is to highlight the differences in philosophy between uh, active hedging program and a passive hedging program so i put the additional artificial constraint that whatever you do you have to do it for 100 percent of the position okay so that clarifies your thing okay so we've done it just to simplify matters Okay, so you can keep this here. Now we are going back to uh, this. 
all right so we covered we started with depository financial intermediaries so this let me just give you an over, overview of the uh, of the firms and the economic functions okay <clears throat> so here we are trying to cover the entire financial sector including government entities like central banks so everything that you because you are specializing in finance so you have, one of the important things you need to know at the beginning itself is what are the different types of firms that you get in the, uh, different types of entities that you get in the, that you encounter in the financial sector and what kind of roles do they perform okay there are all kinds of misconceptions and uh, improper use of terminology which we have to correct okay so the way to look at it is obviously first uh, you can look at the another division which I have not done here but it is kind of Im implicit uh, one is that since here put I put non intermediary entities this is the high level classification okay or um, <clears throat> absolute high level classification would be non-financial and financial okay first level classification we non-financial versus financial we can try to do this here just to make this so you understand yeah is the font big enough satyam you can't read this 135 maybe too big now now you can read you don't have to read everything actually because you this stuff you read on your own later on okay but i'm just covering it so the, at least the big part you understand structuring satyam the big part you can read or even chadda is a better guy to ask structuring equals works with tax legal all this stuff you can read okay good okay so um so let me just write it at the very beginning itself uh, the high level classification so that we are very clear about because it's not clearly spelled out in the spreadsheet so we should understand this will also help you to understand how to do taxonomy once again okay so that's a very important skill that you need to know uh, uh, that you need to develop okay so the first classification is uh, non-financial and i'm going to just write everything in capital because it's easier for me to see okay so this doesn't need to look pretty it just needs to get the job done okay so first level is non-financial versus financial okay then under financial we have um, under financial we will have non-intermediary entities are you following the indentation are you following the classification yes, high level classification is non-financial versus those who operate what entities operate in the financial sector what are the entities that operate in the financial sector the high level is non-financial versus financial the first level categorization is this clear are you following <coughs> it's like you come into this campus and you do a first level classification a block students versus b block students and then under a block students you will again put a first further classification mca students bca students pgdm students are you following what i'm doing here okay so this is basically what we are doing <clears throat> all right so non-financial versus financial then under financial we have sorry under financial um, so i'm just going to write okay let me just write financial okay financial we have non-intermediary entities versus intermediary entities this is clear under financial we have non-intermediary entities versus you have a bunch of non-intermediary entities who are listed here in this and then you have a bunch of intermediary entities which I haven't put the uh, I can put another row here and make it uh, intermediary entity I should put two rows and just I didn't want to put so many rows because it just clutters and makes the whole thing go you can't see everything in one shot but anyway let me just put intermediary entities here Did not work. Okay. All right. So intermediary entities versus non-intermediary entities, and then under uh, intermediary entities, I'm going to further classify 
uh, as uh, I'm going to further create uh, create a further sub classification as um, so this is again under intermediary entities uh, depository uh, make this further down further intended okay now this is obviously against um, this is too big now I can't make it fit in one line so I'm going to make it non depository financial intermediaries this is clear I just want to make it fit in one line Okay, now is everybody highly confused? Are you all highly confused now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Just just to understand how to do a classification, to be clear about the classification. High level, non-financial versus financial. We'll understand why non-financial has been listed under the finance sector. Because there are non-financial essentially manufacturing firms. Okay. But their corporate treasuries will interact with the financial sector. So that's why they operate in the financial sector. So they're non-financial firms. But they operate in the financial sector that's why we have a category called non-financial okay so non-financial versus financial under financial you have non-intermediary versus intermediary under intermediary entities uh, you have depository dfi versus ndfi okay uh, and that i think covers it okay so you have financial non-financial intermediary entities under intermediary entities there are two types of intermediary entities okay there is a um, uh, depository finance you have depository financial intermediaries and you have ndfi non-depository financial entities is it clear to everyone okay fine so just to understand uh, the high level uh, the taxonomy all the way down and now we'll go we are now just going through this stuff so yesterday we had already covered depository financial intermediaries these are just your commercial banks okay so if you read this book i've given you a book uh, reference here this matter this is a very good website so I keep giving you websites from which you can read <coughs> because everything on the internet is not high quality okay in fact most of it is not very good quality but this this site has a lot of other information also taxes legal this that it's a very good website you can read this okay uh, the taxonomy may not always match what I'm giving you but what he's giving is not, the information will not be wrong the conceptual information will not be wrong okay very good website okay so I've taken some material from the website and given it to you you can uh, just look at that so depository financial intermediaries the main concept first you have to understand what we did yesterday that is that the depository financial I'm going to put all the uh, explanations here itself okay so that you have everything in one sheet okay you can just navigate this so you have this situation where you have this depositors okay in one box and if you want to make it look a little nicer you have one box you have one box here we'll put another little column here and okay so banks and you have the borrowing box okay so that's the banks are intermediary the banks are intermediating between the borrowers and the uh, depositors okay their depositors are essentially like the banks are a lender now they're intermediating as I, as I said yesterday that these are principal to principal transactions so there are two principal to principal transactions involved one between bank and this guy and one between bank and this guy okay two separate independent transactions so if the borrower defaults the bank cannot tell the depositor to get lost okay the bank still has to pay the depositor okay so that is the deal so that's why it's called deposit very simple and he's given examples of credit unions and all those are u.s institutions okay so essentially so here now saksham and uh, dharam we have to cut marks you are engaged in some discussion okay i'm going to do it who will keep track sina you keep track so that we don't have to waste time in the class you keep track you're the scorekeeper here minus two for tanuj okay your group has been generally quite disciplined but again you have now slipped up no 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 warning now the class has already started 
No, just write Tanuj Mahesh too. He's the team leader. TJ. Okay. Now, uh, uh, so what, what are we saying? Uh, depository financial intermediaries. Okay. So banks are commercial banks are your classical depository financial intermediary. So the terms you need to learn are this depository for a DFI, and then what they are doing is financial intermediation. The function that they are performing is called financial intermediation. So normally, when people say financial intermediation. This is what they are normally referring to. That is between banks. Okay. Normally, by when they say financial intermediation, okay, they are referring. Although you also have NDFI, but when people use the word, <coughs> generally what they mean is DFI. They are referring to DFI. Okay. <coughs> Which one? So at DFI, I am telling you, it's commercial banks, Canada Bank, Access Bank. Non DFI, we are coming to. So right now, we are in that category. So, in this, since let's go through the notes also, just read this on your own. But just very simple direct finance. Okay, here he's discussed uh, DFI, so I'm just putting extracted this, and you need to know about these two other terms also. Simple, very simple. Direct finance means you're directly selling securities to investors. Okay, there is no in intermediary involved. Okay. And indirect is when you're actually going through an intermediary. Okay, that is basically indirect finance is essentially when you're getting it from these uh, <coughs> banks. Okay, the bank bank financing is essentially a example of indirect financing because you're not getting it directly from the. See, this guy is not directly financing this guy. He is going through the banks. So this borrower, when he's getting the financing, he's getting it indirectly, not from the direct source of funds. That is not directly from the depositor. He's getting it through the bank. Is this clear? That's why it's called indirect finance. Okay. So just two terms. And then what you should know essentially is that I don't know if he's mentioned this here. That if you want to look at the evolution of the of financial systems, I will just put that in here. Okay. That direct finance. Okay. Just gonna write this as direct finance emerges later in most um, countries. Okay, so direct finance is essentially financing through the capital markets. Remember, because you're directly selling securities to the issuing, uh, you're directly selling securities to the investing public. Okay, when you're doing through capital markets. Okay, so you're directly selling. So normally, what you see is. When you look at the historical development of uh, financial sectors in various countries, what emerges initially is the indirect finance. Okay, that is the bank based financing system. That is what usually emerges for initially, initially. And then later stages, at later stages of development, you have the development of direct financing, which is through the capital markets. Okay, so which is why one simple way to understand whether a country's financial sector is well developed or not is to look at the depth and uh, quality of the capital markets are you following what i'm saying that typically capital markets that is direct uh, direct financing capital markets based financing which is direct financing historically when you look at our various countries you look at their development that tends to emerge later what starts off what starts off the financing of the financial sector is indirect what is happening here now lakshay also write down one i don't know which group lakshay is in tanvi's group Whose group is Lakshan? <laughs> Tanvi. Okay, write down Tanvi minus two. We just write down once. We know that if they're going to do it again, we'll have. Okay. So, uh, <coughs> what? Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, so what was I saying? So, so this is the historical uh, phenomenon that we have observed. So that. Uh, direct financing tends to develop much later in the economy and indirect financing usually develops earlier so the bank based financing develops earlier so one of the ways you can gauge the level of development of a country's financial sector is by assessing how deep the capital markets how deep and liquid the capital markets are okay so you can see one of the classic examples you can see is in India where which sector do you think is which kind of financing do you think is more dominant in India not NBFC. I'm talking between direct and indirect. Indirect. Yeah. indirect is more dominant. Okay, so that straight away tells you that this country is not financially well developed. 
our financial sector is not well developed. You compare this to the US, you will find that the capital markets are actually more dominant. So the banks are actually struggling, they are competing with each other to give finance. Most companies are accessing uh, funds directly through the capital markets. That's because the US is by far, I mean even compared to Europe, the US is like generations ahead of any other country in the world in terms of capital markets, okay? Capital markets development and whole financial sector, the development of the financial sector. That's why everybody when they have surpluses, you see all these countries, China, Taiwan, all these countries who have huge uh, foreign reserves. Okay, even our foreign reserves, where are most of the reserves invested in the US capital markets because that is the deepest and most liquid capital market uh, in the world. Okay, so you can look at a country's development by looking, you can gauge the country's development by looking at the development of the capital market. Okay, in India, you see in particular debt capital markets are very underdeveloped given the size of this economy. We are now the fifth largest economy in the world. It is a disaster basically. If you look at the development of the debt capital markets, it's a total disaster. So it's totally unacceptable. Okay, this has only happened because of stupid regulation, over overzealous regulation. It has basically it's a it's hamstrung our ability to finance. We should have had a thriving capital market uh, by this time, but because our people don't have you know there's, there's a disease in the brain. Okay, so one thing is clear now. This is the point that we wanted to make. Is this clear to everybody that direct finance so we've already discussed what is direct and indirect and historically understanding that direct finance usually emerges later in most countries okay so so everybody follows the logic now okay you follow the logic what I'm saying so cap market uh, development uh, depth liquidity uh, etc can serve as a proxy um, as, shouldn't use the word proxy as an indicator of overall fin sector development is this clear to everybody why i'm saying this is this clear okay so there's something else also you need to be aware of and you're learning these terms so financial intermediation we have already discussed okay dfi is what normally people are referring to although he has talked about in the more general sense but i'm just telling you so under this financial intermediation what have we said here under financial intermediation he has talked about uh, depository you can read all this stuff i'm not going to cover everything you read it and like what Tanuj is doing i find he's quite disciplined in following up with the notes okay so we have seen multiple instances so if that's what you should be doing you should be following the notes and then anytime you have a question about anything you should ask and then i'll clarify it otherwise it is understood that you have understood all this stuff okay so he's classifying again under financial intermediation he's going into dfi okay he's going to dfi and then he will cover non-dfi okay so that's some of this stuff is quite obvious you guys are also doing a course on banking yes. right so some of this material will be covered Sorry. Sorry? Not Aren't you supposed to have a banking course in this semester? <laughs> okay, DFI. Okay, so now the non DFI, let's go back to the spreadsheet. If you don't follow at any point of time, please ask. Okay, it's very important to have your concepts clear here. Now we are going into non DFI. There's a whole bunch of non DFIs. We will start with the IB and B. Okay investment bank now this is where there's a lot of confusion because you have been looking at courses where they're talking about investment banking that is actually not investment banking okay so people in this country people will throw out terms like without thinking okay without understanding and thinking so the first category of non-dfi we are looking at is is uh, now again there's too much talking guys i can't see who's talking but there's too much talking there should be no background noise okay right <clears throat> under non-dfi the first category we're going to look at is MB and IB and MB. Okay, IB is the you guys can read at the back something we can read that in my, my IB is the American term, MB is the British term. Okay, it's the same thing. So mainly, what do they do? Read this um, here. Maybe I can make this. If I make this a little smaller, then you can see everything in one uh, view. But can Satyam still read? Okay enable capital raising in primary markets you can read it okay it's fine so <coughs> so we'll do it this way 
so this is what they do now understand this because you've been given a wrong impression about investment banking in the courses that you in the in those professional courses that you were looking at they're actually discussing m a m a advisory is not investment bank you need to understand what is classical investment banking it's a bit like if i say that in a sweet shop okay in a sweet shop in all sweet shops you will get uh, you know rasgullas and jalebis okay but in some of the bigger sweet shops you may also get samosas and kachoris and other stuff okay but that does not mean that every when you see talking about a sweet shop you will get some samosas and kachoris you understand what i'm saying yes. in the larger sweet shop they will have a wide range of products but in the in every sweet shop you will get jalebis and rasgullas because that is the definition of a sweet shop okay is this clear so that's why you have to understand what is the essence of investment banking pure form of investment banking what does it involve okay it does not involve m a advisory it just so happens that in the large investment banks because they are so large in those investment they are still called investment banks but they also have m a advisory they have market making they have all kinds of other stuff but that does not mean that that is m a by that is investment banking so investment banking essentially refers to this what we have written here primary capital markets activity okay enabling primary capital markets activity okay so how does that work now that's why remember now we are calling them non depository ndfi we are categorizing them under ndfi okay so the way the exchange works and the uh, way the uh, transaction works in this now what you have okay now i'm just going to copy hopefully the box is also copied out okay now let's have this okay yeah good now we're going to make this investors okay depositors or investors no let's not call them depositors let's call them investors okay now these guys okay ib stroke mb okay now what is happening is and these are the not the borrowers but the issuers so we are going to call them security issuers are you following what i'm saying what does borrowing mean what type of capital was is borrowing referring to debt debt okay so when you say borrower obviously you no longer you are not referring to equity okay you are only referring to debt okay but that's why i have changed this term in the place of borrowers i am putting security issuers okay so what are the two basic types of securities that you could encounter debt and equity okay remember for so the classical use of the term security we don't mean stuff like foreign exchange and commodities okay so the classical use of the term security refers to debt and equity securities okay it is like you are investing money in my firm and i am giving you a piece of paper that is what a security initially was okay i'm giving you a piece of paper saying that you have invested in 5000 shares of my company okay at this so and so price it's basically documenting the fact that you invested money in my company and that means i need to pay you back this amount okay if i have the funds if it's a case of equity is this clear that's where the term security comes from that's why if you look at traditional <clears throat> when you compare with other business schools how finance is being taught in other business schools and if you look at there will be a course called secure sapm security analysis and portfolio okay double a again double a communication going on I don't know double A. Which team are you? <laughs> Tanvi again. Okay, double A. Then write Tanvi again. Write Tanvi, or you against Tanvi you can write minus four. Okay. So that team also needs to be split up. Now, unfortunately, it is very. I don't have enough space to reseat all you guys. Okay. So in this case, what is happening? So are you following why I have changed the language? Are you following why I have changed the language? Because I want to cover both. I'm now describing capital markets, so I want to cover both debt and equity securities. Okay, so I've changed the name to security issuers. So the classical example of securities, the classical, um, sorry, uh, the classical use of the word security refers to only equity and debt. Okay, uh, so that's why I say I was saying uh, I was talking about SAPM. Typically, in most business schools, you'll see there's a book course called SAPM, and you, if you look at those textbooks, they mainly cover equity and debt. They don't cover uh, commodities and currencies. Whereas the way we cover it here is that because the the treatment of markets and all these asset classes is the same. So when you study, you should not study based on particular. Like most people come and say, I want to learn about stock markets. Okay, but we don't start like that. We start with general discussions of markets because many general properties of markets will appear in co currencies, commodities, debt, and equities all over the place. So you should learn 
when you're learning you should learn from as general a perspective as possible okay as is appropriate now what happens is here we have to move this box okay we have to cut up this box and move it somewhere maybe we can move it here what happened <coughs> sorry I'm just gonna move it here and we will make this box disappear <coughs> all right okay now what has happened why did I move them to a different plane because these are not uh, these are not DFI these are NDFI okay now here understand it in terms of the type of transaction here what is happening is <coughs> there is one principal to principal transaction and there is one principal to agent transaction okay let's understand this uh, again from here let me just briefly explain it and then so the pre principal to principal transaction is that investors are directly investing in the securities issued by the issuers these are the guys who need money so you can think of these guys on the right as capital deficit entities okay or funds deficit let's not call it capital let's call it funds these are funds deficit entities okay so you can call this here we can write this here as funds um, deficit okay and here you can call it these guys are fund surplus okay this 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 terminology can apply even in the case of dfi okay for depositors and borrowers so is this clear investors are surplus funds because they have saved and now they are investing their savings so investors are surplus funds so i've written as fund surplus this is okay and the guys who are going to issue security what are they going to get in return they're going to get funds okay they're deficit funds i mean they have a funds deficit so they need to raise funds and they issue security then in return they get funds is this clear okay and that fund those uh, fund that fund is huge those securities could be either debt securities or equity securities is this clear okay so that's what we are now what is happening here is the transaction is actually happening when the ticket is written out there is a principal to principal transaction between investors and security issuers okay here we said there are two principal to principal transactions one here and one here okay here what is happening is there's only one principal to principal transaction directly between security issuers and investors okay but there is also a separate tra and this transaction is facilitated by the IBMB okay we'll just use IB from now on okay it means MB as well so it is actually covered by uh, it is facilitated by the IBMB okay now what is happening is these guys there's a separate transaction which is a small transaction actually that the security issuers will have to pay uh, because the for facilitating the transaction like when you sell your house through a real estate agent when you sell your house through a real estate agent okay so the buy the transaction is between the buyer and the seller okay the sale of the house the transfer deed is between the buyer and the seller but separately usually the seller usually the seller will pay a commission to the real estate agent who has arranged the transaction this is clear so there also there are two transactions there's one pre 2 p transaction between the buyer and the seller and separately because the agent has facilitated the transaction he needs to be paid a fee okay a commission if you think of it that way so therefore there is a separate a principal to agent transaction where the principal is paying his agent the security issuer who has engaged the ib the security issuer has engaged the ib to make the security sale okay to enable the security issuance so the security issuer has to pay the commission to the ib right so this commission will have separate parts like mainly it is the issue management fees for the issue okay and then if you have separately had the issue underwritten okay you understand what underwriting is you understand underwriting i think we've just discussed it before right okay so uh, so there's a separate underwriting fee and all that so you can just think about it as you can forget about underwriting but just for managing the issue there's an issuance fee that has to be paid to compensate the ib for all the effort it has gone through in rounding up all the investors and informing them about the security and then convincing them to buy these securities okay it's the same thing that a real estate agent does a real estate agent is going to convince the buyer that this is a great house please buy it okay uh, is this clear so the, for that you have to come so there are two transactions here one p2p and one p2a okay where the p2a actually is a small much smaller transaction okay 
so that is why these these are called ndfi because there's no deposit going through these guys are still intermediaries but they are ndfi okay because they are not taking deposits from the uh, from the investors and then separately lending it to the giving or uh, giving those funds to the issuers they are not involved in that they are not intermediating in that sense as a principle are you following yes. you see the difference between capital market transactions which are basically examples of direct financing and uh, bank financing which is an example of indirect financing is this clear so far yes. Okay, so we are getting to understand now we need to cover a little bit about investment. So this is basically what uh, the classical this is where, because investment banking is like used so often in this country like right, the term. So you have to understand what classical investment banking is. This is what classical investment banking is enabling the issuance of capital in the primary capital markets. Okay, it could be either DCM or ECM. Remember what DCM ECM is? Debt capital market, equity capital market. ECM, DCM is debt capital market. So for that, you can go back to your old uh, sheet. I'm not reproducing this sheet. This you can go back. This is already in your IFM file also, in your calc file. You can just look for the sheet. Okay. So you have all this uh, classification of uh, DCM and ECM. This is your capital market classification taxonomy which we have already done before remember that yes okay so this applies to now what is happening now let's, let's discuss a little bit more about uh, the uh, where are we okay yeah now let's understand investment banking a little bit more okay a little bit more detail we should have this idea because it's such an important part of the economy <clears throat> okay so normally in an investment bank so having understood the first part the first part is that um, the first part is that uh, your IB essentially IBMB their primary characteristic of an IBMB is to raise enabling enabling the raising of capital in primary capital markets okay so how do they do that they have uh, a little bit more detail inside a cap inside an investment bank you have typically you have three main teams okay actually two main teams and the third one is uh, also sometimes engaged depends on how the com how complex the issue is but we'll discuss the three main teams you have these teams they're called origination distribution and structuring okay these are teams okay it's just like in in the army you have various teams there are people who are bomb disposal experts there are people who are uh, you know maybe some uh, army engineers okay some are commando units etc so you have different teams they specialize in different tasks okay so therefore inside the investment bank which is going to facilitate a, a primary capital market transaction okay it could be I and this applies to both ECM and DCM the structure is the same could be either okay DCM uh, EDCM or ECM so you have a team you have three teams origination distribution and structuring so you need to know about what these guys do you can read all this stuff here I'm just telling you anyway okay so let's say Alibaba is planning to come out with an issue okay so Alibaba is coming planning also the word is already there that they are coming out with an issue okay so what will happen is all the origination teams from all the major investment banks okay some of the major investment banks are like Morgan Stanley Goldman Sachs uh, JP Morgan all these people are these are all major investment banks okay Mer BOA, uh, BOA Merrill Lynch Bank of America has merged with Merrill Lynch Merrill Lynch used to be the investment bank part so now it's called BOA ML okay <clears throat> so these are the major investment banks so their origination teams will all go and line up at Alibaba's off corporate offices and they'll start make presentations that why don't you sell uh, in the US why don't you come out with this issue we can manage 25 billion for you we can sell the shares at this kind of valuation so they will discuss the valuation of the company as well so remember this is a private company going in for an IPO first okay so therefore they're going to discuss the valuation of the company also that's also very important because that determines how much you can raise okay so the overall valuation of the company and then what percentage stake you're selling okay so like you know you saw the valuation of Flipkart uh, yes. this is of course a private transaction uh, but there's a valuation and they sold a certain percentage of the company okay they didn't sell the whole company okay but from that sale uh, you can figure out what the total valuation of the company was yeah so uh, in this case now uh, so they will discuss these kind of things so the origination teams from all the major investment banks will start all lining up in front of Alibaba's office 
and trying to make presentation. This is a typical salesman's job. Okay, so this is a sales job. So also, if you want to understand, like many people in India, when you meet young students, they always are going, "I want to go to investment banking." Most of because they've heard that investment banking pays a lot. Okay, but you have to understand if you want to understand if you want to decide where you want to go, you need to go into areas where your skill set and your interests, uh, you know, are actually I mean, the matching the demands of that particular area. So origination and investment banking, this is a sales job. Okay, let's get it very straight. This is a sales job. Okay, mean it means you have to sit across the desk from a customer who you may be meeting for the first time. You have to convince him to deal with you and not with all the 15 other guys who are lining up outside. Okay, so this is a sales job. No different from when a blue star uh, salesman is going and trying to convince a company you should buy blue star and not some Hitachi or, uh, or some other air conditioner. Okay, it's the same thing. It's conceptually the same thing. So if you don't have the salesman's personality, there are some people who thrive on sales jobs. Okay, like some of your seniors are, are doing quite well in sales job. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just you have to understand whether you enjoy that kind of job or not. Okay, so you have to understand yourself. So, so investment banking origination is a sales job. Let's get it straight. You have to have a good understanding, of course. It's not just going and selling air conditioners. You, if you, that's all you know, you can't sell, you can't do origination. You need to have a very good understanding of global capital markets. Okay, you need to know what is happening in bond markets. If, if interest rates have been going up for a long time, rising very sharply. Okay, that has implications for selling bond, uh, bond issues. Okay, then if equity markets are all uh, tanking, okay, the equity markets are in a deep, uh, you know, sort of a recessionary kind of state, then obviously you very hard to sell equity issues. Okay, so you have to have a very good understanding of uh, financial markets, what's going on, especially in the capital markets. Okay, all these other kinds of uh, what is happening in different economies, what is investor demand like, all these things you have to understand. So you have to have a deep knowledge of financial sector, of, of the financial sector, especially capital markets. But of course, at the end of the day, this is a sales job. Let's get this clear. Okay, there are certain those who are good salesmen. They have the ability. A good salesman is like a striker in football. You've seen what these strikers do. They hang around. They hang around near the goalpost. At the moment an opportunity comes, they pounce like a shark. Okay, so that is basically what a salesman needs to. A good salesman needs to have that kind of killer instinct. That you talk and talk and talk, but eventually you have to close the deal. Okay, so this is what a good salesman needs. So you have to understand that is this something that I'm going to enjoy. Okay, is this something that I'm going to enjoy and is this something that I have the skill for? I mean, do I have the skill set to do this well? So this is what you should be thinking about when you're looking at various jobs. Okay? So don't just say, ah, investment banking sounds very good, you know, study guide, people looking at investment banking. Origination, okay, this is what origination is. So it's much more of a sales job. Uh, the distribution part, what is, what is happening? See, remember what you have to do here? What do you have here? What are you dealing with? You have investors on one side and security issuers on the other side. Okay. Okay. So you have this. So now the origination team goes and markets to these guys. Okay. Convinces them, please do the issue with us, not with the other investment banks. Please give us the lead management because then when the lead issue comes, the lead manager will get the most fees. Okay. When you do the issue, remember that principal to agent transaction when the commission is being paid by the principal. The most fees will go to the map, to the firm which has lead managed the issue. Okay, that means you're the main manager of the whole issue. Make sure that all the securities are sold properly, they're sold at the right price, biggest possible size, all that. Okay, so the lead manager collects all the fees. Okay, so everybody's trying to become, so you try to go there and convince these guys, make us the lead manager. Is this clear? On this side. Now you have to also deal with the investors because the securities have to be sold. After all, you, you promised Alibaba that we will sell 25 billion worth of equity for you you have convinced alibaba now your origination team has convinced them now somebody has to sell it again to the investors so this is where the distribution team comes in okay so this is where you have the distribution team so origination distribution distribution's job is to go and convince the investors now to buy these securities convince them that alibaba 25 billion of shares big size issue coming out at the valuation of the firm is let's say 150 billion or whatever it is at this valuation alibaba is a great buy again now you're essentially it's a sales job again okay little bit more technical <coughs> little less of a sales job than origination okay but still you have to convince them okay this is slightly more technical because investors are quite sophisticated mainly you're dealing with institutional investors okay so mutual fund managers pension fund managers okay endowment managers okay like many these <coughs> colleges in the US 
like Harvard has a 35 billion or something endowment. So Harvard has 35 billion of funds just lying around. They have to be managed and with the returns from that endowment, they are going to run the whole Harvard uh, operation. Okay. So all these guys, they are all investors. Okay. So these now what is happening is the distribution teams from all the IBs is going and hitting all these investors, pension fund, mutual fund, this, that, hedge funds. Now please buy this Alibaba share issue. It's a fantastic deal. Okay. Now you have to again convince them. Okay. That buy one and you know, <laughs> you won't get buy one, get one free, but you have to convince them somehow to buy the securities because then you have to fulfill the promise made by the origination team. Okay. Is this clear? So this is what distribution does again. So if you are going to go into distribution, then these are the skill sets that you need. Understand what has to be done. You have to convince investors. Okay. This requires even more technical knowledge than the origination side. It's more technical because especially bond issues you need to discuss more about the complexities of bond markets. Okay. Why is this a great buy? Why is it this is a bargain bargain uh, at this price, etc. Structuring structuring team may not be required on all uh, types of issues. If it's a very simple issue then uh, structuring teams need not get involved. Okay. It's a plain vanilla uh, debt issue or but structuring can always be involved. I mean, structuring teams will be pulled in when you have more complex issues. Okay. I briefly explain what structured notes are. Okay. Just extracted something from this blog. So if you have a more complex uh, issue, okay. Sometimes you have securities like uh, which are indexed to the way the return is indexed to the price of oil. Now think about India, for instance. Okay. Now, what is our underlying position with respect to oil? Uh, short. 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 Okay. So, Kriti's answer is correct, but you're not confident. Short. Yeah. Okay. So, our underlying position is short, which means when oil prices go down, is it good for us or bad for us? Good for, good good for, for us. us. Okay. So, one of the things that India could do is, let's say, if we are issuing sovereign bonds. Okay. Right now, we also we have been thinking about issuing bonds to NRIs and things like that. Let's say India issues sovereign bonds. Okay. Normally, when you issue bonds, what happens? Let's look at. Uh, I'm just trying to give you a feeling for what is involved in structured issues. Okay, let's um, so if normally when you issue bonds, okay, how do you compensate the lender? What is the consideration in the case of bonds? Yes. Interest. Interest. Okay. So remember when we studied contracts, when we studied contracts, we looked at consideration. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. So in the case of debt issuance, in the case of any debt issuance, the consideration is the interest. Okay. Because think about it. I borrow 100 rupees from you. After five years, I pay back 100 rupees. So then what are you getting? You gave me 100 rupees and I'm paying back 100 rupees after 5 per year. So what you have to be given over and above the principal is the interest. So that is the real consideration. That is why you gave me your, 500, your 100 rupees first. You gave it to me only because I promised to pay you interest. So that is the consideration in the case of a debt transaction. Okay. If on the one side you have uh, the uh, parting with the money. You gave me your 100 rupees. Okay. And then you gave it to me for 5 years. And so in return, what you're going to get is the interest. Okay. So in, when you think about it in terms of contract law, consideration in the case of a debt issue is actually the interest, the consideration that flows from the borrower to the investor. Okay. That is interest. Okay. So here you have uh, the US 10 year treasury note yield. And let me look at uh, a comparison here. If we add US oil, let's see. You can't actually make out the difference because <laughs> the scale has gone completely haywire. So anyway, the point I was trying to show is actually you can't understand this at all because uh, the scale is so different. But what I'm trying to show you here is actually I can't even knock this off. So are these moves perfectly correlated on the, the orange one is oil prices. The orange one is oil prices and the blue one is 10 year treasury interest rates. Okay. Let's assume that we are borrowing in US dollars for 10 years. Okay. Are these two perfectly correlated? No. no. Okay. So you could have a situation where oil prices are falling. Okay. Uh, but uh, or you could let's have a situation where oil prices are rising, 
okay and interest rates are also rising okay think about this if india has issued notes if india has issued uh, bonds okay and interest rate this is actually a 10 year interest rate but even short term interest rates are rising what is happening at this stage you see how suddenly the pattern has changed you notice earlier the the linkage was not that strong in this part of the chart which is 2011 onwards to about um, here 2015 the linkage is not that strong but after 2015 do you notice a change are you noticing a change in the correlation we are looking at correlation here you remember correlation from statistics yes. have you met this person before correlation yes. somebody called correlation you remember very little, very little. <laughs> okay but actually what we are looking at visually here is correlation are you following yes sir. so do you see a change yes, sir. after 2015 do you see a change now it is much more closely correlated highly correlated now okay so think about this from India's point of view if we are paying interest on bonds if we are paying interest on bonds which we have issued okay and what uh, so interest rates are going up so our interest costs are going up is this clear yes and what is happening to oil prices after 2015 after 2016 onwards they are also going up yes. <laughs> so how is this working out for us is this good for us very bad double whammy on the negative side yes, sir. We, are short. we are short oil so oil prices are going up means there's again strain on the budget then secondly also what is happening is interest rates are also going up so our interest burden is also increasing so it's a double whammy for us okay so one of the things that India can do is if it's issuing a bond okay you issue a bond as a structured bond or structured note okay what happens is why do we call it a structured note because it's not a conventional bond. conventional bond will just pay interest okay conventional bond will just pay interest you issue the bond as a structured note so what it does is that the note will not pay interest okay it will not pay interest according to interest rates in financial markets it will pay interest by a formula according to a formula where when one minute there's still talking going on here guys. i can't see who it is but there's still talking going on no talking please so ideally what india should do in a structured note is make sure that you know you can arrange the terms in the debt issue right you arrange the terms in such a way that we are not going to pay conventional interest according to market interest rates but what we will do for you for the investors okay now this is india talking as an as an issuer of bonds okay what we will do for you as an investor is when oil prices are low we will pay higher interest rates than the market and when oil prices are rising or oil prices are high okay or when they are rising we will pay lower interest rates than the market are you following what i'm saying yes. okay so first you see a conventional bond issue a conventional bond issue has to pay interest according to market interest rates okay market interest rates you can see in the blue line blue line you can see market interest rates going up now after 2016 oil prices and market interest rates are going up together so india looks at this and says this is not a good deal for us because we are getting hit on both sides okay oil is also hurting us and interest outflow is also hurting us so let's do a bond issue in which this is going to be a structured note okay so this the financial markets allow for all these kinds of innovations okay and that is what happens in countries like india we have so much regulation then you can't have innovation <coughs> you have so much regulation people will not innovate the international capital markets you have a lot of innovation so one of the things that the market will allow you to do is to go for a structured note in a structured note you are not going to pay interest according to conventional market interest rates like a conventional bond will pay interest on market interest rates but this is a structured note okay structured means it has been kind of customized okay so in a structured note you will not pay interest according to conventional market interest rates but you have to give something to the investor so what you are saying to the investor as an issuer is look i will pay you higher interest when oil prices are falling I'll pay you higher than market interest rates when oil prices are falling. You can work out a formula. You can work out a formula according to how it, you know, based on uh, which will tell you how it will work. But the basic idea is this: that when oil prices are falling, we will pay you much higher interest rates than market market rates. Okay. But when oil prices are rising, we will pay you much lower interest than the market rates. Is this clear? Okay. So it is like being investor friendly and also creating conventional backup. 
I don't know what you mean by a conventional backup. It is investor friendly because it, this kind of thing makes sense. Are you following first the structure of the note? Let's try to understand the structure of the. Are you following the theory now? You understand? Okay. So it is structured note. It is different from a conventional bond issue. Okay. Uh, so it is basically now we are saying that we will pay when the oil prices fall, we will pay you much higher interest rates. When oil prices rise, we will pay you much lower interest rates. This is hedging. This is a sort of hedging. This is a sort of hedging. Okay. Uh, covering your, uh, you know, mitigating your risk overall. Do you see why this makes sense for India? Yes. That when oil prices are falling, we will make we will pay higher interest rates yes. because we can afford to. Because when oil prices are falling, then it is good for us. We are making money on our oil position. Yes. Okay. The budget constraint is much less. Okay. The government doesn't have to spend so much money on uh, buying oil. Okay. So therefore, it makes sense for India because uh, we can pay much more. We can afford to pay higher interest rates when oil prices are falling. And similarly, when oil prices are rising, we are getting away with paying much lower interest rates so the interest burden is less so it makes sense for india you understand this now okay on the investor side what will happen is the distribution team will go and find investors they will find investors who have a bearish view on oil okay try to understand now this is the origination side india makes sense for india okay the origination team told us we can do this for you and for us when oil prices are low, we'll pay higher interest rate. I'm happy to do that. Okay. Now on the distribution side, the distribution team will go and find investors bearish market view. who have a bearish market view on oil. Are you following the logic here? Yes. What kind of investor will buy this kind of a structured note, which pays very high interest rates when oil prices are falling and pays very low interest rates when oil prices are rising? Speculator, yes, but what kind of view does he have on oil in order to buy this note? Everybody is not convinced. Is my question clear? You have understood the structure of the note. It pays higher interest rates when oil prices fall. It pays much lower interest rates when oil prices rise. Okay. What kind of investor will buy this note? That is an investor with what kind of market view is likely to want to buy this note? Bearish market view on oil is everyone kind of thing. I'm yes. not getting at the back of the class. I'm not getting uh, responses. Pranav, are you convinced? Yes. Mansi, okay. Chada, market view is bearish. That's why he will buy this note. Investors market view is bearish on oil. And of course, in any market, you can always find people who are bearish. Some people will be bullish. Some people will have bearish. Okay. That's why you have a market where exchanges are going on. Exchanges are going on. Okay. So uh, that's why. So what the distribution team is going to do is they are going to go and find investors who have a bearish view on oil. So because they have a bearish view on oil, they expect the oil price will fall, and so they expect to make abnormal returns on interest in the in this India bond. Is this clear to everybody? Okay. So this is an example of what a structured note might look like. Okay. I've given you the blog entry from in that blog itself. You can talk. You can read a little bit about what kind of notes that Bank of America had come out with okay, that got into some trouble with your regulators. But you can do this kind of bond issue. The point is you can do this kind of bond issue in the international capital markets. So this is an example of a structured note. Now the structuring team, remember we said origination, distribution and structuring. The what the structuring team does is they come out with these kind of structures. Okay, remember this, this skill so now you look think about skill sets and what kind of job you want to do in investment banking. What kind of skill set do you think structuring needs? Do they need sales skills? No. Structuring team? No. They need to be highly technical. Okay, so they need to have a very good understanding of financial markets. They need to have a good understanding of derivative products, Regulate. pricing, etc. Bit of regulation also. So that's why I said here, structuring will have to work with tax, legal, regulatory, plus the trading desk because in certain jurisdictions you may not be allowed to sell certain types of issues so tax legal regulatory has to also come in so structuring will liaise with all these different parts of the organization and come up with a structure so this is a highly technical job so if you feel that you're inclined to a technical job then you would go into a structuring kind of role so you don't just don't go and say i want to do i banking i banking your i banking in inside i banking itself the roles the skill sets that are required are very different the mentality of a salesman is very different from the mentality of a structuring guy or technical guy. Are you following? Are you getting all this? Yes, sir. 
okay so these are the three basic parts okay so structuring is going to be involved in this kind of a bond issue in structuring of the whole transaction tax legal regulatory everything overall market structure what the formula is going to be okay so they have to interact obviously with origination and distribution also because what will what will the customer accept what will the issuer accept what will the investor want okay what is the formula that can be said that can satisfy both people both sides okay so they have to do all that and the structuring team will come up with the uh, final structure of the note is this clear to everyone yes. okay so this is basically what investment banking is primary capital markets activity enabling that and then obviously you have the three teams origination distribution structuring okay <coughs> all right now you can read this now what happens typically is So what am I saying here? In order to get a mandate, remember, who makes the the lead manager gets the highest fees. When the issuer has to pay fees to the uh, investment banks, okay, who manage the issue, there are usually more than one, okay. There'll be a large uh, team, but there is one manager which is the lead manager usually, okay. So the lead manager will get the highest fees, just like in a pride of lions, the biggest lion will eat first then the other lines will come and eat okay so that's how it works so uh, the lead manager so everybody wants to get the lead manager mandate so usually in order to get a primary mandate in, in, a, in an issue you also need to have secondary markets capability because what will happen is think about this when the when the distribution team when the distribution team is going to the investors the mutual fund managers and hedge fund managers and telling them please buy the stock of Alibaba or please buy this bonds from India okay what the investor is going to say is fine I will buy it but are you going to provide market making support in the secondary market because if I want to remember because it's a primary now and you're buying it in a primary capital market transaction but because it's a public issue okay it's a public capital market transaction so you should expect to have some kind of secondary market liquidity also right because capital markets generally you have pu public capital markets okay so uh, you should expect the investors going to expect that if i need to sell these securities i should be able to sell them is this clear so the investor is going to demand from the lead manager that okay i will buy these securities in the primary issue but you must promise to provide market making support which means that let's say ubs is yeah so let's say when you look at the primary capital market transaction so what is happening is all these investment banks are going to the issuer okay they're going to this guy sorry and they're going to the investors and convincing the investors the distribution team from the IB is going to the investors and trying to convince the investor that buy this security it's a great deal okay this this company is undervalued Alibaba is undervalued please buy these shares at this price it's a fantastic deal the price will go up okay so the investor is going to say okay I'll buy it but you must promise to provide secondary market support for this issue in this in the sense that you must be able to make markets in this price remember what market making involves how many prices do you have to make two. two you have to provide both bid and offer prices okay so therefore what will happen suppose UBS has got the lead management mandate okay now UBS is uh, distributing distribution team is trying to go to investors and try to convince them that you have to buy this Alibaba issue it's a great deal okay so the investor is going to tell them okay fine I'll do it but you must promise to provide secondary market support through market making so that means that UBS has to commit to the investor that we will make markets in Alibaba shares in the secondary market you remember now secondary market so the investor let's say whatever fidelity mutual fund has bought some shares let's say they buy five million shares of alibaba in the primary issue later on if they want to sell maybe two million of those shares after three months they should be able to call up ubs or you know contact ubs the market making desk and ask for a two-way price and then sell those shares to them is it are you following this market making you remember quoting two-way prices 
okay so in practice what is going to happen is the in investor is not going to just because remember these are public capital markets so therefore the security should be freely transferable in private uh, transactions private companies securities are not freely transferable so that's why the investor who is buying uh, securities in a primary capital markets transaction in the public capital markets will expect that the investment bank that is selling him the security is going to provide some secondary market support that later on if I want to sell my shares who do I go to are you following it's not some doesn't seem to be people are not convinced or they have just uh, collapsed are you falling, feeling low energy yes, lunch time is approaching so you are feeling hungry yes, so people are very uh, there's no responses coming from the back you have given up yes, why yes, okay guys now please be engaged as I told you I've already told you twice I'm not here to make finance interesting to you okay so <laughs> if you find this lecture tutorial method boring it's too bad for you we need to cover a lot of material you should already be interested in finance and your job is to master the concepts that we are discussing so you have to be engaged okay so I'm not here to like you know show some burst some crackers make it interesting in various ways show you some videos and this that okay so you have to just this is like a maths class you have to, you have to understand the concepts or like a physics class okay okay guys let's get engaged now Come on. We have 10 15 more minutes. Let's try and cover material. So, are you following this point? The point I'm trying to make is this that, in fact, okay, although classical investment banking, classical investment banking is refers to the what is happening? Why is there so much talking? Classical investment banking refers to the PCM activity, primary capital markets, okay, but in fact what will happen is when you are going to be a uh, if you want to be a powerhouse investment bank in the primary capital markets you have to be able to provide some secondary market market making support for those kinds of those issues which you are which you want to lead manage are you following this because the investor will expect some kind of secondary market liquidity to be provided in the securities that he is buying in the primary issue is this clear what was your question the function no, no, trade it freely, but where? Where will the market makers come? Because the retail investors, they are not going to provide two way prices. So, but in IPO, before coming, the shares are offered to big institutional investors and marketplace. So, they set the price and they come. See, let's get this very clear. The big institutional investors you are referring to, they will be mostly mutual funds, pension funds, mutual funds, right? Let's understand the category. What kind of market players? We said how many players are there? How many types of players are there? Three. Three types of players. Now, under speculators, what are the two categories? Direct speculators. And market makers and directional speculators. Okay, let's be clear. So, when you are talking about big institutional investors, what you have in mind are people like pension funds, mutual funds, hedge funds, etc. Okay, now what, what do you think they are? Which category of player are they? Are they arbitrages? They are speculators, but in what category of speculator? Mutual funds, you think mutual funds make markets? HDFC mutual fund is making two way prices. No. So, these guys are directional speculators. Let's understand the category. That's why I said these are all conceptual matters you are discussing, and your concepts have to be clear. You need to be able to call back any of the concepts we have covered and put in particular categories into particular boxes. So let's be clear about this. Pension funds, hedge funds, mutual funds, these are all directional speculators. Okay. They are price takers. Okay. And if they show a price, they will show only one side of the price that I am a seller. So they do not make markets. Making markets means two way prices. So the investor wants to know that when the investor when he's buying issues in a price. So this market making doesn't just happen. There are people who are actually making markets. Their job is to make markets. Okay. It doesn't just happen. Some of the stuff that is coming is some investors are showing a selling interest. 
one side price only some investors are showing a buying interest one side price only okay but there are also players in the market who are market makers they are always showing two-way prices so what the institutional investor wants to know when they are buying shares in a primary issue is they want to know that UBS is going to later on provide secondary market market making support for this issue so later on if I want to buy some more shares of Alibaba or I want to sell some of my Alibaba shares I should be able to call up UBS and ask for a two-way price is this clear so institutional investors will not buy these shares unless they get this kind of guarantee is this point clear now to everybody yeah market makers in India any of the investment banks who are actually managing issues they will have to make markets in those shares that is the commitment they will have to give so if you look at any investment bank in a JM financial okay JM financial uh, an investment advisory okay it's one of the older investment the Indian origin investment Kotak uh, Kotak Mahindra if you take right access to whatever the, all the merchant banking elements of these people they have to make secondary market they have to give the commitment to the investor that we will make markets in the secondary market for you otherwise why should I buy the primary issue but I need to have no no Oanda is yeah Oanda is also a market maker but Oanda is not dealing with shares individually okay so it's a just think of it as a market maker so if before the investor buys the shares from the lead manager of the primary issue he will demand that you guys better be there as a backup when I want to sell some of my shares or I want to buy some more shares I should be able to call up your trading desk and ask for a two-way price so the UBS securities trading desk will have to make markets in those issues where they are lead managers okay or other senior position in the issue uh, in the uh, you know panoply of investment banks managing the issue is this clear yes. is everyone clear about this point yes. has a platform where we can yeah that's a platform that's a different platform but the point is that they are uh, they have to make that is not necessarily on that also you will see the market making prices okay that is for you to trade on but the separate point is that the institutional investor should be able to call up the investment bank the trading desk and ask for a two-way price for those securities which they have been sold by the investment bank in the primary issue process is clear they have to provide secondary market liquidity otherwise why will the investor buy those shares they will investors institutional investor trade in large volumes they trade in large volume so they need to have the guarantee that I can call up and ask for a two-way price in large volume is this point clear to everybody okay I'm not going to spend more time on this point the point I'm trying to demonstrate here <coughs> is that although investment banking is concerned with the private okay now you cut marks for Ria also right Ria, Ria is which team <laughs> why are you talking to him <laughs> now write Ria we'll find, find out you can just write Ria Ria is Achal's team so just write Achal okay there's too much talking going on I'm I'm bursting my voice with my already my throat is gone and you guys are all switching off saying I'm given up like Tushar has given up okay uh, you are much younger than me. You should not give up so easily. Okay. All right, guys. So you can have step six. Step six I'll have later. Okay. So the point I'm trying to emphasize is, first of all, that investment banking is not M&A. M&A is an advisory activity. So that we will cover later. Okay. Investment banking is primarily concerned with the primary capital markets uh, enabling, uh, you know, function. Okay, they enable, they are enabling primary capital markets issuance. Okay, but in fact, what happens is to manage. That's the primary identification of an investment bank, the primary function. But in fact, what happens is, in order to run a successful investment bank, you also have to run a secondary markets uh, trading operation to make markets in those securities because the institutional investors will demand that from you okay so in fact in an investment bank that's why secondary market capability I've said secondary market capability is also required in order to get a mandate to lead manager prime uh, uh, a primary capital markets issue okay so in the secondary markets you have uh, again you have three teams okay and this is there in all uh, all kinds of activities again let me just um, okay. 
this will come in market making as well we'll just uh, let's cover this okay, so we'll, we'll do this classification so if you look at a secondary market capital market uh, trading operation or any other market making operation okay in capital markets you cover only debt and equities okay so other market making operations which we see later they will be we'll cover currencies and commodities as well so in all these kinds of operations you will have and again this is for your understanding of the roles involved okay you have front middle and back office okay under front office i'm not writing front office i'm just writing front okay you have Again, this is important for you to understand uh, the different types of roles and what are the different demands of the different types of roles. Okay, so typically when you think of equity research, remember you have equity research as one of the key kinds of roles. Okay, so that will fall under this kind of area. Okay, equity research, the research people will, so these guys are going to write research reports on companies. Okay, so you have under front office, you will have three types of roles okay sales trading and research first you have okay here now let's also write uh, Sandhya and Vaibhav are you on the same team no, 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 I have seen you communicating one no no one minute no argument no argument okay no no you have looked at her I see you one sec. one sec okay guys are you on the same team no argument if you argue I'll cut double marks what is are you on the same team no, 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 no. Just write something in my book. I'll work it out later. Today's course. See, this is why I like this setting as opposed to the finance lab. I can catch more people. Okay. Um, okay, so, so now what I, one sec. Uh, so, <laughs> under secondary capital markets or any kind of trading operation, you'll have uh, any kind of market making operation, you'll have front, middle, back office. Okay. Then, under front office, you have sales trading research. Okay middle office typically will be what we call okay sometimes people might put this in okay so risk management and then back office is just processing okay uh, deal processing okay deal processing so let's try and understand this also because this is part of your understanding of roles front office back office middle office okay so under front office sales trading research again okay? different kind of sales uh, secure uh, skills required now remember that the market making operation is going on okay under the trading desk under the head of trading so under sales trading research what the trading guys are doing is they are doing the market making part okay so here the trading is the market making part let me just put an mm here okay so i said what did i say you need to have a secondary capital markets capability because when you're doing the primary issue the investor will not buy shares from you or debt from you okay Be unless you commit to them that i will make markets in this share in this in these equities and in these bonds okay or notes after the issue I will make a secondary market that means I have to provide two-way prices so that job is done by the trading desk now we are looking at the secondary markets operation that's why although IV is normally with PC, uh, associated with PCM but in fact to get those PCM mandates you also need to have a SCM operation secondary capital markets okay and in that you will have the sales trading and research the trading guys will have to make the markets they are making markets okay so they are making markets in shares of Alibaba then those guys are getting blocks of shares somebody comes and dumps 2 million shares okay now he's long 2 million shares the market maker some other guy comes and takes half a million shares buys half a million shares so now his net position is one and a half million shares etc okay so this these guys also want to have some kind of sales support if they can do block trades with other institutional investors then it becomes easier for the traders to manage their risk okay so this alibaba trader let's say initially he got given some 3 million shares then uh, another guy came and took 1 million shares so now he's still left holding 2 million shares now if he can get some sales support some salesman on his desk can go and find some other institutional investor who wants to buy 2 million shares of alibaba then the market maker can quickly sell those uh, shares to that uh, institutional investor 
so that's why the sales team is there to provide a sales support to the market maker and remember what do market makers want quiet markets and what what else do we want volume. High, volume. High, volume. High, volume. high volume high volume so the job of the sales team is to support the market making desk by bringing in volume go around all over the world find out investors who want to trade in alibaba and bring them to trade with your market maker so that guy gets high volume okay and he gets he, it makes it easier for him to manage the risk and he's making markets is this clear it's time okay so you owe 13 seconds i don't i owe you 13 seconds okay no not five okay okay fine go but you guys have to engage i mean you are all adults now i can't repeat the same message as i've already told you it's not efficient for us we have to as a jointly as a team between you and i we have to cover we have to ensure that you guys have mastered certain concepts in finance okay so i can't have you sitting like children wait please entertain me you know balloons and this and that balloons you know so i am not here to entertain you your job is to pay attention yeah <laughs> passive but in the notes i have only used static and dynamic so what that means is we have to be particular with the terminology yes dynamic is static good very good tanuj tanuj is the only one who is meticulously going through the notes no sir it is good because it will help help us in developing the meeting particular stuff okay so yeah you are taking clean in meeting yeah 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 no no it's good that you're going to that's so like everybody should be doing that so like is okay uh, let's second, do let's do the penalty like secondary market any other technical question your question is technical understanding uh, you you were talking about some basic understanding about the trading part that we were supposed to do we'll do this tomorrow then i'll remind you again about this at the beginning the book also i have a question book the one new is uh, that is that, okay that is not so important but i'll mention that so i have a question just make sure that any of your batches are not taking that book should take it for sure it's been given it to everybody the brown one has already been given uh, that's your book yes then uh, in secondary markets like we have uh, in investment bank that is dealing with the secondary market we have three major options trading uh, sales sales uh, trading and research also risk management four middle office sir four you can do operations also if you want you have four types of jobs the main objective is just to provide liquidity Maybe, to the uh, most of the mbas most of the mbas will go into either front middle uh, they will either go to sales trading research or risk management no i have different mbas will not go to back office no uh, they can some of them can operations uh, related jobs but you can think of all four all four like uh, in uh, in trade uh, in this trading department they are quoting uh, to a prices bid and offer and uh, sales uh, is uh, supporting them through business development like uh, that is the sales team business development like you buy alibaba share so that uh, you should deal with them so uh, and because this is necessary uh, to be uh, successful in the operations of any investment bank pcm scm to be successful oh, yes, to, be, uh, to run a successful uh, investment bank in both pcm market and ecm uh, and scm market so, to be successful in pcm we need to have a good scm operation and so what is the main uh, major role of equity equity research analysts 
Yes, to provide research, we'll discuss that. We'll discuss that in the class next day. And risk management is in middle. Middle office. Hedging and all that. No, we will discuss all that. We have not covered it yet. I have not covered, I only covered sales and trading. Okay. So tomorrow I'll start with research and go through this. Is this stuff useful for you guys to get to know about the role? So this is very what much necessary is, because we need to know what is the role, how the financial is, sector of, a, of an economy works. So this is very very much important. So you also know like what to do, and what we kind also, of skill set is required. Some suggest some, some books so that we can uh, like to also re always refer to the classical theories or this cl classical working of the investment bank. So uh, suggest some books. There is no book. I am writing all these books. There is no book that I know of which explains all this. That's like why all I'm the conventional stuff. That's why, that's why I am writing the notes. There is no book that I know that explains all this. So what is the name of the book which was again was talking about? Which is that book, that uh, that brown book, no? Spreadsheet Which models. We have been given. Working, working, yeah. working spreadsheet on financial models, models with uh, MS Excel. Yeah. So that is actually a book for IFM. Okay. okay. Actually, you sir wanted a pure IFM book. But we haven't also, even read the book of uh, IPM in the pre pre in the previous semester. Nobody stopped you from reading it. And and what about the book? Nobody has like we have been uh, <laughs> using all the all the your no, notes, but nobody stopped you from reading the book. <laughs> Did I stop you from reading no, no. the book? We are open to both also. Yeah. So the objective of our trading in an Onada will be to make profits and not Onada, Oanda. Oanda. So, so the objective of our trading on Oanda will be to make profits and yeah. apart from that to minimize the risk profits. towards the greatest end. Because then uh, net of HPNL and underlying PNL, you can maximize your total PNL. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So